So please join me in welcoming director Sophia Coppola to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is such a nice way to start the day with that um, warm welcome, so thank you. Good morning. Thanks. So um, let's start talking about The Beguiled. Um, you know, I know that you kind of consciously chose to adapt the novel as opposed to the 1971 film, and so I just would love to hear a little bit about kind of choosing to go back to the original source material and working with that adaptation and what that process was like for you. Yeah, thank you. I, I would never, Mrs. Loud, I would never want to remake someone else's film and try to replicate what they did, but I when I saw the Don Siegel film, I thought it was such a curious story and um, and it stayed in my mind and I thought about how differently I would have approached that story and it's because it's about a group of women isolated during the Civil War time and a enemy soldier comes in and it's um, what what happens. I thought, oh, I would love to see this story from the female character's point of view and and um, this group of women that's from, you know, little young girls to adult women and all at different stages and how they interact and, and very cut off from the world. Um, so I just thought about how, how I would approach that story in a different way and I thought um, it could be a whole, a, diff a different movie and I, I found the book which was like a pulpy 60s out of print book and, and I tried to forget the film um, and just approach the material as if how would I adapt this story in my own way and and in the way that I've done with other books where I I took what was interesting to me and then also filled it in with experiences from my life and um, and and just tried to approach it in a new way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that you kind of wrote specifically for like Naomi. I mean, and yeah, um, Kirsten, Kirsten oh. and L and. So um, can you talk a little bit about that process and kind of like how you, you know, found each of their characters maybe while you were like looking at the source material? And then also I'm really interested in what the process was like finding kind of the younger girls because they're all so incredible in the movie and they work so well as an ensemble together. Oh yeah, thanks. When I was thinking about the project and working on the script, I uh, was, ex I love working with Kirsten Dunn, so I thought oh, she can play the this prim and proper school teacher, which is so opposite of her personality. She's very effervescent, and I thought it was interesting to, to see her do something really different. And and when I worked with Elle Fanning, she was 11, and, I'm, and I loved working with her, and I thought, oh, now she's old enough to play the you know, kind of 17-year-old mm -hmm. um, character. And also because she's a really sweet girl, to have her play kind of the naughty bad girl was um, something you know would be, I thought would be fun to see yeah. what she would do with that. And then I've always loved Nicole Kidman, so it really helped me when I was writing to to picture her, and I was very grateful that she agreed to to join us. Um, and then I, it was really great to just meet all these young actresses for the the other students, and and really had to think of them as a as a group of who how they would work together, and who we we, we had there were so many young actresses that were great, but having to pick which ones you know could fit in the story. Yeah. When what was the what kind of like rehearsal process did you have? Like did the, especially cause Colin Farrell character, you know, like he's very much an outsider. So did you do kind of, did you silo him a bit so that he didn't really know them and felt like an outsider? And you know, what kind of work did yeah. you do with them to kind of like bring them together, the women? We did, we had a, uh, about a week of rehearsals together in the real locations or also in old, um, one of the oldest houses in New Orleans. We filmed in New Orleans. And we kept Colin separate as much as we could, so so he wasn't a part of that. So we spent time with the girls, and Nicole um, was really in that role of the she was Miss Martha, and all the rehearsals she was. So she was there with advisors teaching them about sewing and etiquette and dance. We had a dance teacher, but 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 Nicole was always supervising, and um, and picking on like criticizing Kirsten all the time because that was like starting the dynamics mm -hmm. um, during the rehearsal process so that when you start filming you believe that they're a group and the, the young girls um, would all do school together they had to do school so they really bonded and became a little group of friends which um, was really helpful so then when we started filming you really felt you could believe I think that they're that they're a group mm -hmm. and I wanted them to feel almost like um, a bouquet of flowers where they're all the costumes are like in yeah. similar hues and they kind of blend together, but then they each have their own personality within that yeah. group. Um, are there, you know, I think the thing that kind of struck me as I was like watching the film for the first time is there's so much humor 
kind of like within the script and like those dynamics because like they're kind of like tearing each other down at times and it you know like that dinner scene's a great moment where it's like you know they're like picking apart that Kirsten is dressed up for the night. Um, so can you talk about how you kind of like work to bring out that humor on set? Yeah, I mean the the premise to me had had a lot of humor because it's it's such an over the top um, story and though for me underneath it all it was about things that were important to me and about looking at you know, the power struggle between men and women and the dynamics of women. But um, on the surface, it had this really, you know, melodramatic setting and world. And, and I like that they're um, keeping it set at that time because Southern women were like an exaggeration of femininity and how women should act. So to be able to kind of play with that. Um, but yet, when I was writing at the dialogue, I, I was, you know, having fun of the subtext that what they're really saying is really completely different than the dialogue. So I think we all enjoyed the, the humor of it and then um, really bringing it out when they were doing the scenes. And I think another interesting kind of genre that you're exploring in this is a little bit of like horror. You know, there's a lot of like horror elements and that kind of like creeping dread that like kind of like, you know, permeates the film. Um, was that fun for you to kind of go into a different genre for yourself and like push, you know, like into, you know, like a new world? Yeah, definitely. I've never, I've never really done a genre film and yeah. definitely not that one. So it was fun to play with the motifs of kind of gothic horror. And we, um, yeah, we got into it. And, and, and for me, it was a challenge of how do you do that, but also keep my own personality and style mm -hmm. in it. So it was, um, yeah, it was interesting and a new challenge for me when writing the story and, um, and just the approach. And, and it was fun with, uh, you know, working with a cinematographer and like in the, in the last section of the film, it turns darker, the, the angles get more dramatic. And, yeah. and, um, and also just like that, that there's a kind of the, uh, those films with, from the 60s of girls in petticoats and nightgowns with candelabras. So getting to do some of that um, was, was fun. Yeah, I, something I do like about the cinematography, and it, in a way, it's like the landscape, but like the house and like the you know southern landscape and like kind of the swampy nature of it all um, really feels like another character in the film. And like, did you work with the DP to kind of like frame that? And I guess also production design as well to kind of make the house feel you know such like old and like lived in. What was that process like? Yeah, to me, um, the location is such a big, I mean, I think with any film, but especially just creating that world and taking the audience into another world with the being able to shoot on a real location and the, the, those oak trees with the Spanish moss, it's so particular to that region. Um, and then the art department did a lot of work to make this old plantation house look neglected and, and to show that these women were trying to hold on to this era that doesn't exist anymore and they, and they were not capable of of taking care of it, yeah. and so they're out in their petticoats having to garden because there's no one to take care of them, and um, and just to show that they're kind of clinging to this bygone era, mm -hmm. and and also to feel like I always felt like the nature was this kind of threat that was starting to engulf their delicate little world. Mm -hmm. So so um, the art department spent a lot of time, yeah, with building these old decrepit vines and to show the decay of this this world that that, that house wasn't really like that. Yeah, and I think something else that's interesting, like visually in the film, is um, like there's a sense of like claustrophobia. I think you know, like where the, like the framing feels very tight, and is that yeah. something that you kind of like collaborated with your DP on to like evoke that kind of like feeling of like being trapped in this house? Yeah, definitely. I loved the idea of the story because it is so claustrophobic, and we shot in a real house, so that we were aware of that when we were filming it, that we wanted to have this claustrophobia, claustrophobia and these girls aren't able to go out into their lives, they're, they're stuck, and Kirsten's character is at the age where she, you know, she should start her own family and life, and they're all trapped together. Um, so we wanted to show that in the, in the photography, and Philippe Lesord, um, our great French cinematographer, um, helped me a lot with um, how we were gonna film it to have that claustrophobic feeling, and as the story progresses, it gets more and more um, claustrophobic. It starts out kind of expansive and beautiful in this kind of feminine, lovely world so that um, Colin's character has no idea that the threat that is underneath it. Mm -hmm. And then as the story progresses, it gets darker, more stark, and, and more claustrophobic. And for me as a director, it was really exciting to have a film that's just one location and it's really just about the acting. It's almost like a play. Mm -hmm where I could be really focused on the, the dialogue and the characters' interaction and, and that all the focus is on, on that. So for me, that was really interesting to really just delve into the performances. Well, and I know your background, like you studied both photography and painting. So does that like background kind of give you, 
do you have like do you feel like you have a different approach to kind of like working with cinematography and like do you know what I mean like having that like visual background do you what's your collaboration like with your DPs that you've like worked with over you know kind of like your filmmaking career do you know exactly what you want do they bring something to the table as well yeah that's such a, a important collaboration a, a, a partner really for the director um, and and I just feel like he's my right hand and he or she but I've worked with guys um, uh, to help me you know convey the story because it's a visual medium how do you tell the story through the visuals and um, and I and I felt like having a background in photography helped me to articulate to the cinematographers what I have in mind. So we spent a lot of time always looking at references of photos or, or paintings in this case to be able to um, talk about the style of the film. So that's really the starting point after I write the script is sitting down with the art department and cinematographer and starting to look at references and talk about what the, the look and the, of the world is. Yeah, do you work with references like in other ways, like do you provide, because I know some filmmakers like, you know, will be like, oh, here's like a list of films that I like want people to like look at and that's like the style I'm going for or like, you know, also with like actors like providing like written work or, you know, do you work from references and were there any that you, you know, kind of like put out into the set this, you know, for this film to kind of like prepare the cast and the crew? Yeah, not so many film references or more photography mm -hmm. references or paintings just um, for the visual world or, or images that remind me of how I want to shoot something. I, even in my script, I, I tape pictures uh, as a reminder of what I want that shot to look like or evoke something, and, and it helps me to, to show the cinematographer. Um, but, we do, but we do look at films sometimes, too. Like this, we watched um, Tess t with um, the art department and cinematographer and costume designer to all just kind of be on the same page of, of um, looking at the palette or, or the cinematography. And, um, and we watched um, Ann Ross, the production designer, and I watched The Innocence with Deborah Kerr just to get into that kind of gothic tone feeling. And um, so I, for me, the, the pre-production is really an important time where we um, look at images together. And, and, um, and because when you're shooting, it's so intense. It's, it's, um, we, our schedule is you know, under 30 days, so you don't have a lot of time to, yeah. to think. You just have to keep going. So to have that time to prepare before so we're all on the same page and all in sync is really important. Yeah, um, I think that something else that I find like really interesting is that you kind of like outside of just the like visual storytelling, you've had such like a great use of music in your films like over the years and this film you didn't do, you know, you didn't do the like Marie Antoinette thing and put in like contemporary music in like a period setting. So what was that decision like and was that kind of like fun to kind of like break out of like your own kind of like, sh you know, like, yeah. like system that you've been like doing and what was that process like with your like composer? Yeah, I mean, I think in any film, the the way you're, the way it's going to look and the way it sounds is all coming from telling the story that you're telling. And in Marie Antoinette, um, I was trying to show that she was a teenage girl and kind of be irreverent about the whole thing. And so it, it's not random, but it was we were having fun with yeah. like let's remember that they're kids. And and also I, I was into the kind of whole new romantic thing that was going on in the 80s, which reminds me of my teenageness. But anyway, in this one, um, it was really important for me that it feel really, that the tension was the main focus, that, that you felt that they were isolated and the tension of the story and, and that they're suffocating and they're all buttoned up in the heat of the South with all this, you know, sexual um, repression. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I really wanted to emphasize and to feel that the war was in the distance, really hear the cannons and the sound of nature. And just the, when you add music, it, it alleviates tension usually. Yeah. So to have it be really stark and uncomfortable um, so that you could feel like what the characters were feeling. And, and hopefully, I want it to be naturalistic so you felt like you were with them at, at that time. And hopefully, you could relate to the characters, even though it's another era. But, you know, not like a big Hollywood version, but a more uh, naturalistic approach. Yeah, and I, I mean, I love the moments in this that do have music where like the girls are singing and like, you know, doing that sort of stuff. How did you kind of like come to pick, uh, you know, kind of like the older songs that they're singing and how did you work with the actors? Like were they, you know, did they have to take any sort of like lesson? Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. were they prepared to kind of like do that before, you know, starting the film? Yeah, you know, a couple, two of the girls were in Matilda on Broadway, so they're, they're all, all of them could sing and dance and they were, you know, Great, um, you know, open to, to to that, and the song Lorena that they all sing as a group was actually referenced in the book. It was a popular song at the time, but both the South and the North both was beloved. So, um, so it was nice to you know 
look at music from that time and then just when those little girls sing, it's so so sweet. So um, and such a contrast to the kind of starkness of not having music in the film. Yeah. I think you notice it more. And and I wanted to hear the sounds of like the cicadas and the nature to show their isolation. And then I think um, yeah, those moments of them singing together is it's always sweet when <laughs> when yeah. kids sing. I think and and if they're they're and also it's part of their culture that you know that's how they spent time. They they sewed and music was their entertainment and. So to try to incorporate that. Yeah. There's an interesting theme as I kind of like prepared for this, like thinking about, you know, Virgin Suicides, Marie Antoinette, and this film, and even a little bit in somewhere that like there's this idea of like the place, like, you know, the women kind of sequestered away in houses, like specifically with the, you know, the three women, you know, like the sisters in Virgin Suicide and like Marie Antoinette in Versailles. And so is that a theme that you have like realized that is like, you know, like permeating your work a bit? And is it something that you like enjoy kind of like exploring that like kind of idea of like these women that it like society or like their family have like tucked away for like a reason? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not at the time, I'm just drawn to things and then now I can see there's a connection. Yeah. Actually, when I looked at Beguiled, it reminded me of Virgin Suicides yeah. and I felt like, oh, there, but I, I didn't. Sh I, I, I was drawn to it. I thought, oh, I can kind of go into this familiar territory, but in a really different way. And now there are more women at different ages and more mm -hmm. mature. But there was definitely when we were shooting the dinner scene. There's a dinner scene in Virgin Suicides where the boy comes over. And it's very similar. And I just when I, we were filming this, I, it hit me that I always knew that there was a connection. Mm -hmm. But, um, but no, it's always it's always hard to tell. I know that I'm interested in stories about identity and finding finding your own. Uh, a place or identity mm -hmm. in the world that you were born into or that you were, you know, that you didn't choose. Yeah. And so they all, they, a lot of them have that element of like trying to find your place within your circumstance that you have found yourself and that um, is interesting to me. Yeah. It's interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I think something else that I find really interesting about you is that you are both, you're Th you know, you're a triple threat. You know, you direct, you write, and you produce most of your films. Does that provide like any challenges, like on set, kind of like wearing all those hats? And then also, is it you know, alternatively, like really freeing to kind of like be totally in charge? <laughs> yeah, to me, it's. Well, I mean, directors are control freaks, so um, you want to have as much creative control over what you're making. Um, you know, and I, yeah, it's, it's something that is is. Uh, so close to me and you know my heart's in it so I I want to make sure that I'm involved in all the choices and so with producing I'm really um, involved in the, the where our financing is from mm -hmm. and how it's going to be put out and just because it's something that you know you work so long on and care about that as much as you can be involved in every air aspect is important to me and and the, and the beginning of telling the story is really in in, in the writing the script and then mm -hmm. how you tell it visually and all the different stages so um so it's something that I enjoy. I feel like they all, it, it doesn't feel like separate yeah. paths as much as it, it's all integral to the, to the, what you're making. Yeah. Um, as a writer, do you keep your actors on script? Like, do you encourage like improvisation? Do you, you know, like do different versions of scenes? You know, I mean, specifically about The Beguiled, but if there's like, you know, any interesting kind of like moments where like, the actors have maybe veered off script like in previous work as well? Yeah, I think it depends on the scene. I, I do like, I love improvisation because it's fun and, mm -hmm. and it's always a surprise what people come up with, especially working with Bill Murray. One of the reasons I wanted to work with him is because he's such a great improviser and I knew I just could throw him in a situation mm -hmm. and watch and it would be fun and interesting and funny. Um, so it depends on the scene and also in Virgin Suicides or you know, when there's a group of girls just hanging out, you kind of, I would just let the camera roll and, and to, so it got to a point where it felt Real and their interactions, mm -hmm. but with Beguiled, it was more, I was more focused on the um, the dialogue mm -hmm. and 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 it was more like a play because each line really had a lot of impact impact in the story mm -hmm. as opposed to if there's a scene where they're kind of having a party or something, then you kind of see what happens. But that it was more kind of precise, so so we rehearsed and and stuck to it as much as we we could. But I'm always open to what the actors want to try if they want to try something else. I think it was a challenge because it's period, so. If the line doesn't feel right, you have to think of how to reword it in a way mm -hmm. that feels re naturalistic, but also is appropriate for the time. So, so, so in Bagal, that was more. Um, we stuck to the script more because um, the dialogue was more precise. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Well, I always so like to um, when you're rehearsing or blocking a scene. I always like to see you know what the actors try and what I want to consider what's comfortable for them too. 
Well, and since you do, you know, kind of like routinely work with like certain people like Kirsten and stuff, like are, do they, I mean, is there a shorthand there? Like, does she, I mean, clearly you guys are friends as yeah. well, like off, you know, off screen. And so is there a shorthand there for like performances and like she kind of maybe knows what like, how far she could take like an improv like line or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons I like to work with her is that we have um, a similar taste, I guess. Like she just gets what I like and we, we have a similar sensibility of what we think is funny or mm -hmm. what we think is corny. So I think that's that's what's great about working with people that you're on the same page with mm -hmm. is that you don't have to explain a lot. Yeah. And there'll be moments where she would do a scene and then I would barely say anything and she's like, okay, yeah, I got it. Like, you know, so we do have a shorthand, which is really nice, but also because we've worked together for so long. Mm -hmm. Does her kind of ability to have that shorthand, does it like help, does she does she ever like help like the other actors like kind of like being like, no, Sophia wouldn't like that that way. Like, I don't, <laughs> no. I, you know, does that ever come up? <laughs> no. Not that you're aware no, of. No, I mean, yeah, not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, think um, she's, everyone's always gung-ho to help, but, but, um, but it doesn't kind of, cross into another, she's not trying to direct the whole yeah, thing. I know, yeah, I yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. from the sidelines. <laughs> um, I mean, something that I do find interesting outside of your acting collaborations, like you've worked with a lot of the same people like for a number of films, like specifically your production designer, you guys have worked together like on five films. Um, so what is that process like? Does she still surprise you with like ideas or do you, you know, like if you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this period film like in New Orleans, does she just like come and it's like, all perfect. Like how how much you know collaboration are you guys doing at this point? Yeah, um, I mean it's so great for me because she just gets me so quickly. I don't have to explain mm -hmm. very much, and she gets it. Or I'll give you know I'll give a few cues, but she knows my sensibilities so well, and and she has great taste, and she's smart, and has great ideas. So she just adds to that. So mm -hmm. it's it's really um, it's really helpful to me, and it, it it brings a lot. And she she'll mention a reference or something that will give me ideas. So it's just a really it's just really helpful to have. A team, and I remember when I was starting out, starting my career, someone saying, "Really spend time focusing on your team," mm. and I really put a lot of thought into that because it's it, it is such a collaborative process to have a team that you can really rely on and and trust, and they help you and help you, you know, bring ideas. So yeah. um, it's really yeah helpful and important to me. And and um, and Anne Ross, I've worked with for a long time, and she just it's another thing like Kirsten, like they, she there's not a lot of explaining. She knows what I would like, or I, we can, I can explain it in a way. We have, yeah, a shorthand also. Shorthand. Mm -hmm. um, you, I mean, you do also, I mean, you work with a lot of women kind of behind the camera, and so as, I mean, and as well as you, you know, have these like great kind of like ensemble films with women, I mean, you're a female director, and like, so is it really important for you to have kind of like a nice like group of women kind of around you, and you know, as you've been putting together that like, you know, kind of like group of close collaborators, is that something you're like thinking about? Like if somebody leaves, you're like, oh, I've got to, you know, like. Oh yeah, I mean, I just, um, Anne, the production designer yeah. said on most jobs, she's the only woman in a van full of guys on right. these. And I forget because my, our sets are, there are a lot of women and, um, you yeah, know, I just, I, I love having not, yeah, having as many women as we can on set and, and the art department and, uh, and the costume designer, but all the art department was all women and we try to hire um, women and have, young women intern film oh, students wow. uh, on set. We had like three young women and um, just just a, a nice balance and also, um, yeah, why should it be all guys? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Um, yeah, because I mean, you're even your like editor is like, you know, you guys have worked together. Like it's just, it's really nice to see kind of like a filmmaker who like builds this group and you kind of like get this sense of like a, like closely like collaborated set, but then I also feel like your films have such like a top to bottom kind of like design aesthetic. Like as you're kind of like concepting an idea and like writing something, how soon are you thinking about like all of the elements and how soon are you bringing in some of these people like your production design and like costume design to kind of like, you know, think about things from like, like font choices for like, you know, titles and things like that. Is it an early process or is it more after the edit is kind of done? Oh no, it's early on when I'm writing the script, I'm already collecting images or I'll ask mm -hmm. Anne if she can start to put together some references because it, it just feeds my imagination to see images that can give me ideas for shots. And I think, you know, like anything you're picturing it the same as when you're reading a book, you picture that world. So mm -hmm. you just start to try to, I start to co collect images so that I can, um, talk to my crew about it, because it's easier to look at pictures and yeah. say this kind of world than try to describe it with words. Um, but that's 
the, the visual world is definitely um, something that happens early on. And um, and then Sarah Flack, my editor, I'm, yeah, I love working with her because we um, have a shorthand and, and a shared sensibility of what we think is funny or what we think is touching. So, um, and I remember talking to her about this even when I was writing the script. And she actually, we had, we had looked at um, some scenes from the, the original Don Siegel film, because mm -hmm. I cut down a few scenes to try to show it to, to um, when we were trying to get it made, like, you know, just like kind of distill down parts that I had liked about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, well, and how, I mean, some filmmakers I feel like are really involved in the editing process and then some are a little bit more passive and like working with her, do you, like, does she go away and do like an edit and then like bring it to you or are you like in the room kind of like helping her like choose like all, you know, like how involved in the process are you at this point? Um, she's editing while we're filming. So we were down in New Orleans shooting and she was in New York um, starting to assemble the scenes and she would, which was helpful because if we're missing something she can tell us. Mm -hmm. So she, she'll let us know, yeah, we have everything for that scene or you could try to get more close-ups or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's really helpful that she's assembling it as we go and then if anything is missing, we can try to get it. And then, and then when I come back from um, the shoot, then she has a whole assembly that we look at together. And usually um, that's the hardest thing. I remember my dad always saying, your movie's never as good as dailies and it's never as awful as your first rough cut. And I, I remember my first film, Virgin Suicide, seeing the first rough cut and being so devastated. I thought, oh my God, I've talked to all these people into letting me make a movie and it's terrible. And then it was really traumatic. And then I worked in the edit and finally it turned into a movie, you know, but it, it, it's a process, so. Um, but because Sarah and I work together so much, I think she, she we have the same taste of which performance takes we like, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, um, the assembly isn't as as traumatic, but it, yeah, that, so that, and then we work together, then I, then I come to the edit, and I, and I like that part, because it's sort of like having a nine to five mm -hmm. job where I can drop my kids at school, and they go in the office, yeah. and because they don't have an office job, yeah. I can pretend to have an office job for a little <laughs> while, and, um, yeah, and it's fun because I'm friends with Sarah, so we we um, we sit there all day in our little black room, going <laughs> over and over scenes, and then spend a lot of time thinking what we want to order for lunch when we get stuck. And um, <laughs> and it's I think it's hard to keep a fresh perspective because you're watching the same scenes over and over yeah. and over again, um, but uh, somehow you, you get to the end of it. Yeah. Well, is there anything you try to do in the edit process to keep a fresh perspective? Like, do you go, like, you know, at the end of, like, a nine-to-five day, do you go and, like, watch something totally different to, like, wash your brain of, of you know, yeah. like, your film to then, like, come with fresh eyes the next day? It's funny. I don't watch movies as much when I'm working on them because I feel like I'm so kind of ste steeped in it mm -hmm. or something. I get information overload, I think. But, um, yeah. but um no, I think we try not to watch the whole thing through. We'll watch it kind of in sections, mm -hmm. and um, and even when you're writing, there's you know I'm conscious of the three three acts, and when you're editing, you can you can kind of separate them and just focus on one section or or, or by reels. You know, we'll, we'll just look at a certain reel and work on that for a while, and sometimes do them out of order. Um, but it is, yeah, and then try not to, and also watching it big is really different than um, yeah. watching, we're editing on a, on a small monitor, but then when you watch it big, the timing changes. I mm -hmm. think cuts are a different length because you're having to take them in in a different way. So, so then we'll, every once in a while, we'll screen it big and yeah. kind of see how it feels. And then, and then working on the, the sound of music just adds a whole other element. And Sarah's really great with music too, so that's always fun when you get to start playing with the music. Yeah, I mean, how many? About how many times do you end up like watching, like the like like on a big screen? And and at a certain point, since you've seen it so many times, are you somebody like you know when it like premieres at like a festival at Cannes, like are you excited to watch it with an audience at that point? Because I'm sure like you're getting a vibe off of them, but also have you have you gotten sick of seeing it at that point as well? Yeah. No, it's so it's so exciting when you see it with the audience for yeah. the first time because then it then it feels like a movie where when you're watching it alone, it's just a different experience. Mm -hmm. But I think the communal Thing of watching an audience, uh, watching with an audience and people laugh, or you can just feel if they're with it or not. Mm -hmm. So that's really um, ex exciting. And when we showed it in Cannes, it was the first time we had all seen it finished with the final sound and oh, the okay. first time the actors saw it. And so it's always nerve wracking, but exciting. And I don't know, we, we, I don't even know how many times we watch it, but usually it's just, I'll, sometimes I'll invite a few friends just to kind of get, to get, ask them if things make sense or yeah. you know, just, it helps when you're editing to show people because you can feel when things are working or not. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, something that I'm curious about is, like, you won Best Director at Cannes for this movie. 
I mean, how does that feel at this point? Because like you've, you know, you've racked up some accomplishments like over your career, but is that still like an exciting moment to kind of like have that validation? Yeah, it was really exciting. I mean, Cannes is such an important international kind of film community, and I, I grew up going there, um, and it was really a thrill. And, and I didn't know the history. I had no idea that only one woman had yeah. won, you know, 50 years ago or something. I had no idea. So when that when when I got the award, there was an, you know an article about that, and um, and I remember walk. I live in the West Village in New York. I was walking to school, and like different women on the street were like, "Go, Sophia!" <laughs> and it was so <laughs> cool. And like my daughters, I have a, a seven and a ten year old, mm -hmm. and and the seven-year-old was like telling her class, you know. That, so yeah, it was really, it was really like a big deal to them. They're like, you know, the first woman to win this yeah. award, and so um, it meant a lot to me. I mean, just as a, as director to have any, uh, you know, encouragement like that. But it was um, it was especially exciting because I felt like I got to share that with other women. Yeah, well, and that's something that I find interesting is that, you know, some of your accomplishments. It's such a boys club. I, but yeah, I, I mean, was starting course. at such a boys club, so it's it's fun to be validated. Yeah, well, and, and that's something, I mean, you, like, you were, like, the youngest woman to, like, ever be, like, nominated as, like, Best Director Oscar. So I feel like you've, like, managed to, like, get your, like, you know, like, get your foot in there for, like, women, you know, like, like in the industry. And is that ever overwhelming? Like, I mean, I mean, I'm assuming women come up to you and you're like, I love you so much. Like, you're so great. You know what I mean? And you get that, like, validation sometimes, like, out, you know, like, at events like this or, you know, like, in New York. Um, does it ever feel overwhelming to, like, be that poster woman? Um, I don't think of myself as that, but I remember when Lost in Translation, when I was nominated for the director, it was me mm -hmm. and all these old, old guys, and <laughs> um, and I was, like, in my early 30s, yeah. and, and some of them were really inviting, and some of them were really dismissive. Mm. They just did not want me in the conversation, and and I I just, I'm like, well, I'm I'm going to talk about my movie, what, you yeah. know, whether you like it or not kind of thing. So I, I don't know, and I grew up, you know, with the macho director dad and lots of guys around, and I always felt like I could say my opinion. And yeah. So um, yeah, I just I'm, I just feel grateful that I get to put a feminine point of view out there, and and I'm always happy when you see different points of views in films, and not just you know one group of white guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, I feel like you've you know I mean you got to work with Nicole kind of like on this film, but you like have such great collaborators and you're at this point in your career, like is there is there somebody that's like out there that like you like have like dreamed of working with that you like hope maybe, you know what I mean? Like is there, is there are there still people out there that like you want to bring into the fold at some point? I mean, definitely, I mean, I'm fans of so many, there's so many great actors and to me it's really inspiring to, um, you know, that's what inspires me is to be able to work with these actors and what would they would bring to it mm -hmm. and Nicole helped me when I was writing to imagine what she would do with it, but I'm, um, I can't think of one person in particular that like I'm dying to work with, but that is it is like something that's really motivating, inspiring to get to work with, um, you know, great actors. Yeah, well, and I mean, I know you mentioned it for like this film with Nicole, but as you and I guess like for Bill Murray as well, like in Lost in Translation. So it's like, do you as you start working on a project? think about the cast and who you want and start writing for people? Or is it like as you're writing, you maybe think, oh, this person seems like maybe they would like fit this character. Like, do you yeah. do you often write with like people in mind or does it happen maybe a little bit later in the process? I do, I find it really helpful to picture people even if they don't end up being in it. But um, so, it, it depends on the situation. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll write with a character in mind, I mean, an mm -hmm. actor in mind and sometimes I won't know who that character is mm -hmm. or I'm, I'm, it, it's me as the character, and then I find someone that can can um, take on the the version of that. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I find it really helpful. But then sometimes I don't know. Like I, I love Eddie Murphy. I want to see him in an interesting film. So I, I'd love to make that, but I have no idea for that. For that. So, <laughs> I, so yeah, it, it, I, I am. I'm also I'm motivated by locations, by a place. Like with Lost in Translation, I, the starting point was I want to make a film in Tokyo to mm -hmm. to show what that experience was like for me because I spent time there. Um, and so, so it can be a person or, or the place that can be the starting point. Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, I feel like sometimes this is like a silly question, but like at this point, you know, and I'm sure like there are people out here that are like filmmakers or like people that like want to like work in film. Like, do you, is there like it's something that like maybe somebody told you before you got started that became like this like quintessential advice that you've like carried through your filmmaking career? Is there like something that you feel like people that like want to get into film should really like think about ahead of time that like you didn't think, you know what I mean? Like, like do you have any like lessons or like kind of like advice for like, you know, like new filmmakers? Um, I think there's the idea of just don't ever take no for an answer. When people tell me, no, you can't do that, it just motivates me more to <laughs> yeah. do it. Like, okay, I'm gonna show you I can do it. So yeah. I would say take, 
for me, any um, discouragement I take is motivation. Like I'm going to show you I, that I, you know, this idea is worthwhile yeah. or whatever. So I think just not giving up on if you think it's interesting, then hopefully other people t will too. I mean, with Lost in Translation, it was I was really worried that it was this really indulgent personal story that like who cares about a, um, you know privileged girl that's lost in her life, but I yeah. I had to write what was true to me, and I think um, that it's important that people express the stories that are important to them that they want to see, that they don't see out there already, because I was trying to make films that I felt like I don't I don't see that represented, and mm -hmm. I want to see that, and um, so I think it's um, you know important to, to just try to <laughs> believe that if it's interesting to you, it's, it'll connect to someone else, hopefully. Yeah, well, and is that, like, are there any, <laughs> like lessons like you know like are there any like moments that have happened like on previous films that you were like okay like next time like I'm not going to do it this way like and like learning from like maybe mistakes or like missteps kind of like along the way that you know have really like helped you kind of like forge this path like through you know like your career I mean I think just always rem for me remembering to just trust my instincts and my gut because um like when I was starting, I didn't know that that I could as much, and like just getting more confidence to know that that you have to yeah you know, really trust your instincts because um, that's that's how you it, that that's important and to have confidence in that. And I think it, as I did more work, then I, I I had more confidence in that my um my instincts were were accurate for what I wanted to make. Yeah. Um. I mean, something else that's like interesting, kind of happening like in the world like now is like filmmakers like moving into the realm of like episodic storytelling and like TV, like people like you know auteurs like Steven Soderbergh and like you know we have Wormwood here with like Earl Morris. Have you ever thought about you know going into that world? Like, is, is there like a story that you've like maybe like thought about or at some point like that you think would like really help with like an episodic kind of like format? Yeah, I mean, I know it's an exciting time for TV and a lot of energy and money and and opportunity I guess so um, but I don't um, I have I don't have any ideas that are that long I feel like my scripts are usually short and I have one idea and then I get it out so yeah. but I think it's interesting especially for adapting books because usually it's a challenge to fit a whole book into two hours so the idea that you can make something that's you know six hours long I think is interesting so um, so yeah I think it's it's just a new medium but I haven't um, Tip my toes. <laughs> um, I mean, something that I think is really interesting that you do is that, like, with your collaborations and stuff, like, you, your films feel. I mean, they feel they feel like you're they're coming from like this same like voice and like you you know this film like you kind of like worked in like a different genre. Are there any other like new? like genres or like new areas that like you're excited about maybe like working in, uh, you know, like would you ever go back to like, would you try and make like a straight horror film at this point in your career or, you know, yeah, like a have, Western? <laughs> I don't have any plans to, it's not like, um, I've, yeah, a certain genre that I'm yeah. always wanted to tackle, sci-fi or something, yeah. but um, <laughs> but I, I try to be open and not limit myself because if there was a story that fit in that, but I don't have any, um, yeah, plans to. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I like working in a, smaller budget because I feel like I can have more creative control and not when it gets to be a big scale then you have a lot of other opinions and it's harder I think to have a, a singular vision and I I appreciate movies by people that I feel like that only that person could have made it not not it's not generic like um you know a panel of executives yeah um well I mean I guess like going back to the beguiled a bit like do you like I mean, I read like some interesting stuff about like, you know, like really like going into like rehearsal with actors and, you know, like giving like the women like a handbook on like kind of like being a Southern lady and like stuff like that. Um, how, like how do you kind of like push the actors to like go further into like, do you know what I mean? Like is everybody, like pretty gung ho to like go into it or like have you how have you had to like push people I mean because like this film gets in I mean spoiler alert if you haven't seen The Beguiled but like you know there's like a limb being like cut off at some point in the film and like I mean you know what I mean like how do you get Nicole and get them to like go for that kind of like moment I think actors love to get into it mm -hmm. so um, you kind of just set up the environment and make it uh, comfortable and then let them do, do their thing and you know push them when you think you yeah. need to but but we did I think it's just interesting to 
to immerse yourself in whatever the world is. So we did. We found a book of um, like advice for ladies of how to be, how to behave, and just to read those, you kind of get into the mindset of what what was expected of them at that time or what it was like then. Um, and then the, yeah, this film had more. It was more dramatic moments than I'm I'm used to, but. Um, but but when you're in the you know everyone's in their costumes at night with candles and blood and you know yeah. you, you Nicole helped me a lot to get the the younger girls to really to be more um, you know more, show that they're more scared or kind of push them mm -hmm. so that that helped a lot to have her still being like the mother hen with um, the girls but I think actors love to act and get into it and um, you know just kind of setting up a, a safe environment and in, and in the rehearsals making it playful and. And just make it comfortable that they feel safe, that they can try things, and, and it should be fun and playful. Yeah. Um, did you, I mean, we talked a little bit about, like, Colin kind of being, like, siloed, but what kind of, you know, I mean, did you write specifically for him, or did he kind of come through, like, a casting process as you were, like, trying to find a male lead for the film? Yeah, I did have him in mind, um, and it was, it was that was the hardest part to cast. The women um, were, were clear to me, but to find a guy that, that could be the center of all this attention and he had to be you know sexy and, a, and an object but also intelligent enough to be manipulative and, and to keep their attention because they would seem you know not very interesting if some dumb cute guy was having them you know having a hold on them so he had to be complex enough to be able to manipulate him and in the original book the character was an Irish immigrant and when I met Colin oh. yeah when I met Colin he when he spoke with his natural accent it's so charming and and adds another level of him being an exotic creature foreigner to them so um so and he's so he's really charming and lovable so i i um i instantly could see him in that part yeah and what i mean what i love about his character is how quickly he goes from like the charming guy to this like kind of like monster you know what i mean in like some ways yeah. um how did you kind of like work with him to like balance that kind of like you know performance yeah i mean i think what i in our version, I, in, in the Don Siegel film, you know he's a bad guy right from the beginning. Yeah. And so this was important for me that the, that the audience is learning with the women. They have to, like they want to trust him. Should they trust him? And, and you want to be hopeful along with them. Um, and so it's a surprise that he's more of a bad guy. So that was something that, that we were um, aware of. And then when he really makes that shift. And I think just working with great actors, I knew that, because our, our story could easily have been really campy. I know yeah. it's melodramatic. So... So just that kind of risk of doing something that's in a melodramatic world, but I knew that the actors were so grounded in something real to them that it could be believable. And and Nicole, I think, just you know brought so much kind of heart and emotion to this woman that could have just been like an arch mm -hmm. villain caricature. So um, so I think the actors doing their own preparation and connecting it with something real helped a lot to kind of be able to buy the whole story. Yeah, and something I love about Elle's character in this is that she. Like she has all these great moments of like comedy and like the moment where they're um, like farming and she's just yeah. like, <sighs> like being like a teenager, like so mad that she has to do like a chore. Yeah. Um, what, you know, was that, I mean, cause you've worked together before and yeah. so it's like, you know, and she's grown up into this like older person, but what was that process of kind of like getting her into this like kind of like terrible teenager like role yeah. that she's kind of, you know, doing? Yeah, I think she had fun with it. No, she's, she's got a great sense of humor. And there was stuff in the book that was interesting because um, there was a whole chapter about that character and her backstory that her mother was always looking for a wealthy man and so she was oh. raised to always present herself to men as um, attractive mm -hmm. and, and there are women like that that are you know raised to to uh, attract men you know which um, so the fact that that was based on on some psychology and not just kind of random I think um, I don't know she had fun with it because she was always um, you know, every time you see her, she's presenting herself. And like, there's a scene where they first are singing for him and she like puts her skirt out and, and looks mm -hmm. at him. So she's, that's, she's always um, presenting herself as, a, as an attractive lady yeah. to, to the one man that's around because yeah. I figure she hasn't been able to practice on, on anyone else. So it was fun. She has a good sense of humor about it. Yeah, and well, and I love the, um, the youngest girl that like really, that finds Colin oh, yeah. and like brings him back Una. to the house and like they're, like kind of connection is really great and the moment where she like feels betrayed by him is like so heartbreaking and she's been in a few things but you know like what was the process of kind of like getting them like 
did they have any kind of rehearsals together since they have this kind of like connection? Yeah, no, they, they didn't, but it was always, we always wanted it to feel like she saw him as a big brother character. Mm -hmm. So they each have their own um, relationship to him and she sees him as big brother and, and, and she, her character had lost her brother in, in the war and, mm -hmm. and, and so it was kind of you know needy, needy for that and they're all kind of missing that part and um and the, you know, the big betrayal again like, yeah, when he th when he throws the turtle that's a big <laughs> big moment yeah. of betrayal but um that she yeah because she's always I think she feels like an ownership because she found him that she always feels like they have a special thing yeah. and he makes her feel like that too so I, I love that he knows how to charm each one of them to their own vulnerabilities yeah, yeah. And to show that and yeah. and and to Kirsten he's you know a romantic hero and Nicole he can she can be a real partner and another adult because she's, you know, he's the only other adult in this world. And so he plays up on all their vulnerabilities. Just kind of like diving into the, like, history of that area and things, like, were there any things that you, like, you scripted the film, but then I'm sure you did, like, some research, like, on the time period and stuff. Was there anything that you found kind of, like, within that research phase that you, like, then brought back into the script? Yeah, I think reading journals, real journals of women at that time, what it was like, and I, I had never known about this group or ever seen a film about this period of these southern white women that after they escaped, the slaves had escaped and, after, and the men were at war and they were, you know, raised to, in such a different world and they were kind of holding on to it and just, mm -hmm. um, and kind of forgotten and, and isolated. So I really wanted to, I was curious about this group of women that I had never kind of heard their story and, um, and so to read, yeah, some of the journals of the time, um, and also just the idea of, you know, there's certain ideas of how you're supposed to be feminine, and this was such an exaggerated version, even mm -hmm. though it, you know, it still exists today. That if yeah. you know you're strong, it's looked at a certain way. So I was able to look at kind of some of these expectations of society, but in another era and in a very exaggerated way. But I think that's what's interesting about looking at, at the past is you can, um, you know, still learn for what what it still exists. Yeah. Well, and did you, like, those kinds of journals and things like that, did you, like, bring any, like, parts of those, like, to back to your actors? It's like, oh, like, this, like, you know, like, look at this, like, line, and that's really, like, what I want your character, like, did yeah. that kind of then go into the performance as well? Um, I had, yeah, I, I had sent um, actresses different passages that I thought, um, you know, would help them just kind of get into the mindset. And there were letters of the time and, mm -hmm. and these journals, and then an Elle's character, just kind of a little bit of background of that character. So yeah. um, I think it's always helpful to, uh, you know, as much um, research or to kind of just get yourself in the mindset of that that time. And, and I watched some of the Ken Burns Civil War documentary oh, right. just to like understand yeah. a little bit about that time. Yeah. Well, and do you, um, you know, as you're like writing characters and talking to actors about kind of like what their character is going to be, do you let them kind of like explore that and bring elements into their character? And do you like work with them on that? Is that like a, you know, back and forth conversation you have? I think they do their own preparation yeah. and then they come to it with um, with a plan. But I, I talked to them before about what, um, you know, my ideas about it and then they do their own work to make it personal to them. Yeah. Or is there anything like interesting that somebody like brought to a character on this film or like one of the other films? That, oh, I, yeah. I, I can't think of. Um, I mean, it's always interesting to see what uh, an actor does, and and, um, and and Nicole really impressed me with how she was able to make a character that could be a villain very, you know, bring a sympathetic human yeah. side to her, uh, you know, bringing a, a frailty. Yeah, well, that's what I actually really like about her character is that, like, she could be a villain, but at the same time, you know, like, as I was watching it, she's clearly, like, this woman who's just, like, trying to, like, hold everything together. And, like, her, you know, villainous, like, instincts are just, like, trying to kind of, like... Come from something human. Yeah, yeah. And I I mean, I, that's what I... That's the thing I love about her character so much. And how did... I mean, how did you guys, like... You know, because it's, like, a fine line. How did you kind of, like, work on, like, balancing that? Yeah, I mean, in the script, she had a lot of qualities, and then I think the fact that Nicole made her human, and and that was one of the things that was important to me. I feel like in the Don Siegel film, um, the women are crazy, and you don't really, get, um, you can't really relate. I couldn't relate to them, even though I love that movie as a as a as a, for what it is. But so it was important to me that they're all complex human mm -hmm. uh, women that that their actions are based on whatever their fears or vulnerabilities are and they're not just um deranged women i just want to say you know thank you so much for coming and talking to me today yeah. thank all of thank you, you for coming out